Hello everyone. Within our last tutorial, we examined an application in which I configured a WinTech HMI with a single layer neural network so that it could analyze process data and predict if an alarm was going to occur. Today, we're going to look at some of the mathematics behind the perceptron model. To begin, let's examine the input data. The algorithm processes a two dimensional array of elements where each element in the first dimension corresponds to a feature that correlates with the output. Within our application, we were trying to determine if a machine fault would occur based on a set temperature and pressure. Those were our inputs. Each input is a measurable quality that will help the algorithm determine the output. Now the algorithm may process n number of inputs, but not all inputs are equal. Take, for example, a dataset used to determine if an animal is either a dog or a cow. Both animals have fur, both have four legs, but cows have hoofs and dogs have paws. So the animal's feet may be an important factor when determining if it is either a dog or a cow. Thus, some inputs are more important or have a stronger connection to the output. The strength of the connection is determined by a weight. Initially, our weights are set to a default value of zero. But in the course of training, when the algorithm's prediction is incorrect, it makes a small adjustment to each weight. It does this over and over again until it converges on a set of weights that always yield an accurate prediction. A prediction is made by multiplying each input to the corresponding weight and adding each product together. This is essentially a summation similar to what was shown on the opening slide. However, it is standard practice to consider both the array of inputs and weights as vectors, meaning that calculating the dot product yields the result of our summation. We then take this result and compare it to a threshold used within a step or piecewise function. If the value of our dot product is greater than or equal to the threshold, the perceptron is set to fire and the predicted output is true, or a value of 1. If the result is less than the threshold, the predicted output is false. In code, this calculation is accomplished in two parts. Line 63 calculates the dot product, and line 64 compares the result to our threshold. To adjust the weights, we iterate through the array and set each weight equal to itself, plus the predefined learning rate multiplied by the difference between the actual and predicted output and the current input. The learning rate is a small factor, less than one, that determines how much the weight will be adjusted. Since both the output and our prediction can be either true or false, the difference between the actual output and our prediction will always be an integer between negative one and positive one. This will determine if the weight will increase, decrease, or stay the same. When adjusting the weight, we must take into account the value of the corresponding input. Remember that the weight determines the strength of the connection between each input and the corresponding output. In addition to our inputs, we also include an additional term called a bias. A bias has the effect of shifting the activation function, which increases the flexibility of our algorithm. The bias is implemented as an input with a constant value of 1 meaning that weight 0 is applied as a constant within our summation. And like the other weights, this is a learned parameter, meaning that it will adjust if the prediction made by the perceptron is incorrect. However, unlike the other weights, the amount that the bias weight adjusts is only dependent on the product of the learning rate and the difference between the actual output and the prediction. Furthermore, when considering the array of inputs and the array of weights as position vectors, a bias has the effect of adding an additional dimension. To examine this, consider the following graph. Here we have a data set divided into two groups. I have imposed a mock decision boundary to help us see that this line will not pass through the origin. This is an important point because a position vector always starts at the origin. If I run this data set through our algorithm, it will not converge on a set of weights that result in a decision boundary that divides the two groups. 
But before I continue, let's address what it means to find a decision boundary. A decision boundary is a hyperplane normal to our weight factor. If the algorithm is successful, meaning that it converges on a set of weights that allow us to accurately determine the actual output, then the weight vector will point in the direction of the data set with an output of true, or a value of 1. The equation of a plane normal to our vector is defined by the vector's components. By looking at this equation, we can see that, given any arbitrary weight vector and feature space, our decision boundary will always pass through the origin. So how do we fix this? That's exactly where the bias comes in. By adding a bias to our equation, we can essentially move the decision boundary in any direction along our weight vector. I also mentioned that a bias has the effect of adding an additional dimension. In order to visualize this, I'll add an additional input value of 1 to each data point, and we'll graph our data set in three dimensions. In R cubed, you'll notice that all of our data points are now positioned on plane z equals 1. This slight change will actually allow the algorithm to create a hyperplane that both passes through the origin and divides our data set. And if I graph our weight vector, you'll notice that it points in the direction of the group that has an output value of true, or 1. So now that we understand the importance of our bias, let's talk about convergence. The perceptron model is guaranteed to converge on a set of weights that can divide our data set into two groups, as long as the data set is linearly separable. However, we run our algorithm for a preset amount of iterations, or epochs. So we need to determine if the weights that we calculated are correct. To test convergence, it is standard practice to use a loss function, like mean squared error or sum of squared error. The sum of squared error function and its implementation within our algorithm is quite simple. For each element within our output array, we calculate the difference between the actual output and the predicted output and square the result. The sum of all errors is then calculated and stored within an element in an array. When the algorithm is finished, we print out the calculated weights and errors to our console. The error is an output that we are trying to minimize. So essentially, if our model converges, we should see an error value of 0 at some point within our array. This indicates that our model converged and that the data set is linearly separable. If the algorithm does not converge, then perhaps the data set is not linearly separable. But if you believe it is, then you can adjust the number of epochs, the learning rate, or the threshold until the model converges. I hope you've enjoyed this basic introduction to the mathematics behind the perceptron model. Are you interested in HMI programming? Check out our website, wintechusa.com, for free development software, and then head on over to our YouTube channel for free technical tutorials. Thank you for watching.